ladies and gentlemen, and uh, it's a pleasure to uh, speak on this subject. Uh, in fact, I was uh, invited, and I should actually say that uh, the title of my talk is important. I'm talking about, uh, principally talking about what I regard as the lack of evidence of Ibogaine for treatment of heroin dependence, specifically. Um, I was invited by the International Network of People Who Use Drugs, drugs to give this talk and I'm grateful to them for uh, that invitation and as a uh, stalwart supporter of uh, user organisations of course I accepted. Uh, the form of the invitation specified that they wanted me to provide a harm reductionist scientist critique on Ibogaine and having uh, accepted that invitation that's exactly what I'll do. Now uh, obviously this is uh, an area where there are a wide difference of views. I think it's important uh, before we go through the discussion to emphasize the values that I think many of us in this room, uh, many of us at this conference uh, hold dear as central values for harm reduction. And that is uh, a tolerance and respect for different views, uh, to base policy and practice on evidence, and regarding the reduction of harm as the paramount aim of our activities. Before dealing with Ibogaine specifically, I think it's important to talk a little bit about the regulation of drugs. And I noticed that uh, Howard um, uh, said that the, the goal of his activities, what he'd like to see, is that Ibogaine would become available as a regulated drug. And that's uh, the, that, the, the notion of, of looking at medications in terms of them being regulated is certainly something that resonates with me. Um, <coughs> There was an era when uh, medications were not regulated, and that's not, uh, that was not a happy era. Uh, medications have been progressively regulated throughout the 20th century, and, uh, uh, and it's been an important protection for all people, but particularly for uh, vulnerable populations, and I would certainly include injecting drug users uh, in that category. I'm going to talk about uh, a little bit about how medications are regulated, whether Ibogaine is an effective treatment for heroin dependence, uh, whether Ibogaine actually assists heroin detoxification, whether it's a safe drug, uh, whether we should be doing, some people should be doing more Ibogaine research, and discuss a little bit about Ibogaine advocacy before going on to conclusions. Now, as I mentioned, the uh, area of medical regulation of uh, medications is, uh, has been, uh, um, I think, an important advance in medicine during the 20th century. And the whole system got shaken up very considerably in the 1960s due to the catastrophe that occurred when uh, thalidomide was uh, uh, made available and caused large numbers of deformities in uh, in children uh, when it was given to the pregnant, uh, their pregnant mothers. Uh, so after thalidomide, a new concept developed in medical regulation throughout the world, and that is to regard the, uh, all new drugs were considered to be ineffective and unsafe until proven otherwise. And that's a, a central concept in medical regulation. And all developed countries have developed this, have accepted this approach for all new drugs, without exception. So, drugs used for diabetes and breast cancer and heart disease, uh, and I think drugs used for the treatment of drug dependence should be no exception. And I think if we want to uh, argue the case that uh, Ibogaine should be exempt from that general rule, uh, I would like to see uh, what uh, kind of a case can be made for why drug users uh, should be uh, should be exposed to the risks of, um, of medications of un unknown effectiveness and unknown safety. So let's turn to the question of whether Ibogaine is effective as a um, treatment for heroin dependence. Uh, I think many of us in this room would recognize that uh, we badly need new treatments for heroin dependence. A lot of people around the world uh, who start using heroin, not all, but a lot of them get into serious difficulties and cause great uh, grief to themselves, their loved ones, and, uh, and their communities. Uh, we've got some good treatments for heroin dependence. We don't have nearly enough treatments for heroin dependence. Uh, 
Uh, so I think there'd be widespread agreement with that. Uh, opioid substitution treatments like methadone and buprenorphine are certainly effective and safe, but we, we have very few treatments uh, to offer people these days. Um, and I would also argue that, with, that finding new treatments for heroin dependence is an even greater priority, a much greater priority than finding new agents for use in heroin detoxification. Um, what kind of evidence do we seek when we're looking for uh, data that um, shows that uh, any kind of treatment is effective? Well, we, we'd like to see numbers of studies, not just one or two, but numbers of them, uh, preferably from a number of different countries. Uh, that's not essential, but certainly desirable. But we'd like to see studies, preferably with different kinds of designs. And we'd like to see these studies being having rigorous designs, uh, including, if possible, randomized control trials, uh, which is still the gold standard in this area, although there's controversy about that too. Uh, and a very important criterion is uh, the publication of studies in uh, reputable <coughs> refereed journals. These are all standard for treatments of all conditions uh, that, uh, that we can think of. But I, I think it's uh, beyond argument that the evidence that I began as effective as a treatment for heroin dependence at the moment is minimal. There are relatively few studies uh, it's not clear to me how many of the studies in humans have been uh, gone before human research and ethics committees, and I think that's uh, an area that uh, should be a concern. Uh, many of the studies involve small numbers of subjects, many involve uh, self-reported data, uh, follow-up periods are generally short, the, design, the quality of design is uh, not uh, overwhelming. Most of these studies have uh, uh, not been published in refereed journals and when you look at the fine print many of them contain a lot of uh, uncertainty about um, about the confidence of the conclusions. There's a lot of mites and maybes and could haves and, and appears to and that sort of thing. Uh, could I again be useful for heroin detoxification? And by detoxification let me specify that I'm talking about achieving a safe and comfortable withdrawal from the drug and that, therefore I'm talking about something that's short term. For me, detoxification is not a treatment but it's really a, a prelude to treatment. It's an important thing to provide. Uh, it's, it should be part of the whole system, the whole package that's provided, um, but uh, it's not um, uh, as critical as the need to provide new treatments. Um, we have a very good treatment in the form of buprenorphine for it's very good uh, for heroin detoxification. Um, but in any case, uh, there are many more studies of using ibogaine for detoxification than there are for treatment of heroin dependence. Uh, still, this literature is in a preliminary stage, uh, and a few of the studies, uh, as, as I'm aware of them, compare ibogaine as an agent. Uh, with other agents for uh, detoxification. So overall, for me, uh, this is still, in, uh, the evidence is unconvincing in terms of Ibogaine being useful in humans with heroin dependence in terms of its effectiveness. The supporters uh, of Ibogaine make a number of claims. They argue that Ibogaine reduces drug craving this is a kind of secondary indicator. It's not really, uh, uh, it's, it's helpful if it's there, if it's not there, but it still uh, it provides other benefits. Uh, those other benefits are much more, would be regarded as much more important, uh, such as uh, periods of abstinence following uh, the, the uh, uh, exposure to the drug. Um, they also claim that it reduces opioid withdrawal signs and symptoms, and uh, some of that evidence has been presented tonight. Um, and there's also argument that uh, there are some papers that claim uh, sustained complete resolution of opioid withdrawal syndromes, but uh, I think those, some of those papers, most of those papers, leave something to be desired. Uh, really, this, the, these studies are in uh, what could only be described as phase one. There's no, that's not a criticism. Drugs go through phases. Uh, 
this is the first uh, step in studying drugs is to go through so-called phase one studies and that's where Ibogaine is at the moment. Okay. Uh, Marsh, who's uh, uh, certainly a supporter of Ibogaine, uh, assessed Ibogaine, the Ibogaine literature as follows. There have been few reports of the effects of Ibogaine in humans. Anecdotal accounts of the acute and long-term effects of Ibogaine have included only a small series of case reports from opiate and cocaine addicts, with observations provided for only seven and four subjects respectively. That was published in 2001. Then, same article, the use of Ibogaine for the treatment of drug dependence has been based on anecdotal reports from groups of self-treating addicts that the drug blocked opiate withdrawal and reduced craving for opiates and other illicit drugs for extended time periods. And also, she went on to say, objective investigations of Ibogaine's effects on drug craving and the signs and symptoms of opiate withdrawal have not been done in either research or conventional treatment settings. So, uh, what can we say about the safety of Ibogaine as, uh, in terms of its uh, treatment for heroin dependence? Well, the kind of data we'd like to see is lots of uh, laboratory studies of animals and how it has uh, told us about some of those. We'd like to see studies in humans, um, initially short term, later in the long term. As I said, we're still in phase one, there are no phase two or phase three studies here yet. Eleven deaths have been reported. Uh, on the other hand, some of these uh, claims have been uh, uh, have been criticised, uh, and there's also claims of severe illness in after exposure to ibogaine. Howard's already touched on the question about possible neurotoxicity in rat experiments. I think overall we're still at a stage where the data for the safety of ibogaine is is still at a minimal stage. And we should not make the mistake of assuming that it's going to be a safe drug simply because it's organic. Should we be doing more, or should somebody be doing more research on uh, Ibogaine? Howard's absolutely right that the pharmaceutical industry uh, generally uh, does, not, uh, does very little research on uh, drugs in this area for the reason that Howard mentioned. It's, it seemed to be uh, stigmatizing also for pharmaceutical companies. Um, and researchers will be very selective about what drugs they will choose to, to do research on, whether they're researchers in the academic area or researchers in the commercial area. And they'll generally make decisions partly on theoretical grounds, but even more so on empirical grounds. How good is the data that, uh, from the studies that have, that have been done already? Um, and uh, they will also base their decisions on very hard-nosed assessments of what they regard as the likelihood of achieving success. Another problem in this area is that uh, there, there are real concerns about uh, uh, pharmaceutical companies having intellectual property of a, a drug that is obtained from a plant like this. So, should people just use Ibogaine? Well, in my view, we've got so much experience from around the world of, of the high price that's been paid from cutting corners uh, from bypassing the drug regulation, the medical regulation system. Uh, and thalidomide is a, is a case in point that went through the medical regulatory system at the time, uh, wouldn't get through now. And we do have uh, snake oil drugs uh, in the past and even in the present. And naltrexone is a drug where, uh, which is actively promoted by some, yet the evidence of effectiveness is dismal and the ev evidence of uh, lack of safety is quite impressive. And I hope we don't uh, uh, go into that, uh, hope Ibogaine uh, doesn't follow down that sort of path. Um, so I, I think we have to accept the assumption that Ibogaine is ineffective and unsafe until evidence to the contrary emerges. Just wrapping up. So should, uh, should we um, uh, look at the question of, of advocacy for Ibogaine? Well, Herbert Cleaver has said, ultimately the usefulness of or lack thereof of Ibogaine related compounds in the treatment of addiction will rise or fall on the basis of research. He also said whether or not Ibogaine is useful is a scientific question that can be answered neither by street demonstrations nor by avoiding careful controlled research as scientists our obligation is to keep looking for safe and effective methods to prevent and treat this great international scourge. And finally he said whether the actions against NIDA were ultimately helpful, harmful 
or insignificant in getting the desired results is not totally clear. Then he went on to say, my own, my own view is that there may have been a short-term gain but a long-term loss because of the perceived <coughs> marginalisation of the drug. Um, I won't go through these conclusions in the interests of time, but I think the main point I'd like to make is that we really, in 2008, it may be different in 2009 or beyond, we really do not have evidence that Ibogaine is an effective and safe treatment uh, for heroin dependence, uh, and nor do we have evidence that it's an effective and safe agent for use in heroin detoxification. Thank you very much. And like I said, Alex is going to go to this UN reference group meeting, so we will take some questions as opposed to statements this time for Alex, and then if people want to challenge some of the assumptions in Alex's presentation from the audience after, then we could do that. I see a hand. Hi, I'm Dr. Alberto Sola. I run an Ivo game clinic in Cancun, Mexico. And uh, how can you say that there's no good evidence of effectiveness in the craving and uh, uh, the use of drugs when there is several hundred papers with uh, rats and dogs with self-administered heroin and cocaine that do decrease those self-administered uh, drugs when injected with ibogaine? Well, it's not just my assessment, it's also the assessment of uh, Marsh, as, as I just showed you, who regards herself as an advocate for ibogaine. Uh, and it's because um, the, the, uh, it's not just the existence of multiple publications, the publications have to conform to a certain type and standard, and the, the publications don't conform to those types of standards. They're preliminary studies, they're um, small numbers, self-reported. Uh, I'm not talking about the humans, I'm talking about the animal models that have proved that it does reduce the consumed heroin and cocaine. Those of you uh, didn't hear down the back, um, the question was what about uh, the laboratory studies. Laboratory studies are interesting, but uh, they form the, the basis for how scientists will decide whether or not to investigate uh, a drug in human subjects. But uh, on their own, they, they, uh, they're not regarded as uh, proof of, uh, of efficacy or of safety. Uh, they are, they are they're interesting uh, and they help to decide whether or not to proceed, proceed with studies in humans, but on their own they're not evidence of efficacy or safety. Hi. Um, just to update the um, uh, data for efficacy that you presented uh, from Deborah Mash, um, the evidence for uh, evidence for efficacy and acute withdrawal are two case series with about 65 patients um, showing resolution of withdrawal uh, symptoms. There is also the um, series with regard to drug dependence, which was mainly heroin dependence, that was presented to NIDA that was the basis for their decision to go forward with their NIDA Ibogaine project. Uh, that was about 52 patients who were followed for a period of up to a couple of years. Uh, about a third of them had abstinence beyond the six-month uh, period of follow-up. Uh, that's a treatment effect that's roughly equivalent to about six months in a therapeutic community. And then there's also the existence of the Ibogaine subculture itself, the uh, great uncontrolled experiment, as Frank Vachi has referred to, uh, in which uh, over 50 percent of the people who take Ibogaine have done so for the treatment of opioid of, uh, detoxification, for which there's not much of a um, placebo effect. Um, so, and this is expanded on the basis of word of mouth by about 30 percent over a five-year over a five-year period, annual 30 percent growth rate. So it's quadrupled uh, since 2001 to 2006. Uh, nonetheless, um, I would agree that this is not the stuff of which drug approval is made, and I think there's two perspectives from which to look at this. The perspective from which I look at it is that it's an interesting pharmacological paradigm, uh, which I've referred to. Um, in that's, those are quoting my exact words that I've published. Uh, but I think the perspective you're looking at is someone who's responsible for implementing drug policy on a national level, uh, or making drugs available on a national level. 
And we need to differentiate whether you're talking about the progression through preclinical, phase one, phase two, and phase three, which is what you require. <coughs> Presently, I think the preclinical um, proof of concept model is very strong. Uh, the toxicological evidence was sufficient for the FDA to approve going forward with a phase one study. The phase one study reached uh, the dose of four milligrams per kilogram, which is not the dose that's commonly used for detoxification. And the trail ends there. So I think from your perspective, you're looking at a drug that is somewhere into phase one with phase two and phase three not completed, and you're saying that the drug approval process has not been satisfied. And I think that's objectively an unarguable point of view. Uh, but I think also in terms of whether this is a scientific paradigm, it's interesting that all of the evidence, including the accounts of those treated, and the existence of the subculture, and the confluence of the animal model with the human model in conditions where there's no placebo effect to speak of, uh, the uh, Cochrane uh, reviews, which are the apotheosis of evidence-based medicine, um, there are 56 studies that they felt uh, using conventional methods, uh, clonidine or alpha-2 agonists, uh, methadone, buprenorphine. There are 56 studies that they felt in their reviews were sufficient evidence uh, of quality to include. Only three even had a placebo condition, and all three of those, any treatment effect, the effect of any treatment was quite robust. So the idea that uh, in an uncontrolled study you can observe a treatment effect of opioid withdrawal, I think has some credibility. But again, I think the major difference that um, we're talking about here is whether you're looking at this at a national level, as you are, uh, in terms of implementing uh, drug availability, or whether you're looking at this from a scientific context in terms of evidence for an interesting effect. Another question that comes up, <coughs> given the... <laughs> uh, we needed the question, right. but... Um, given the... Uh, well, I'm actually ending with a question. Uh, given, given the fact that there is really no uh, clear prospect for ibogaine uh, to become available anytime soon, or ibogaine alkaloids to become a, a, to become available anytime soon, um, what is to be done by the individual who has failed other treatments and turns to ibogaine? Uh, I don't think there's an easy answer for this one, but I was wondering what your view is on that. Well, um, just to respond to what you said before I answered the question. There seem to be two parts to what you're saying, and the first part is addressing the question of evidence of effectiveness and safety, and I think we seem to be, have a very similar view on that, that, that if we put that in terms of the level of evidence that's required for regulatory purposes, either gains way short of that at the moment. Then the second part of that is whether research should be done. And um, whether we like it or not, that decision is not going to be made by people in this room. It will be made by senior people in NIDA or in pharmaceutical companies or in academia, and not necessarily in the United States. Um, let's not make that assumption. Uh, just in terms of, uh, um, I'm flattered by your assumption that I have uh, uh, some degree of power in my own country. Let me disabuse you of that uh, uh, straight away, that um, uh, my views are not, uh, uh, I regret to say, not treated with the respect in which I think they deserve to be treated. Um, in regard to your question about what would I say to people who uh, might consider using Ibogaine, well, um, call me conservative if you like, but uh, my doctor perspective, which I was asked to provide, is that people should use medications which are approved by regulatory authorities and, and in terms of medications should not use medications other than that. Um, uh, and uh, I, don't have, I don't feel at all conflicted or ambivalent about that. Um, How about as a harm reductionist? Uh, well, in terms of harm reduction, I think that we have plenty of evidence of other drugs that have been used outside the medical regulatory uh, uh, system uh, which have caused uh, deaths, uh, severe illness uh, and uh, which haven't worked and which are sold as um, uh, highly effective drugs. They're, the medical literature is full of uh, uh, 
Not so long ago, people were claiming that uh, extracts from an apricot kernel was a, a clear cure for cancer, and that that was found to be not only ineffective, but also very damaging. Can you ask a question in another 30 seconds, Dana? Yeah. <laughs> uh, do you support clinical trials of Ibogaine? I don't have an opinion on it. I'm not really uh, in a position to um, do that kind of research myself, and uh, so I wouldn't really make a decision about doing that work or not doing that work. It's not, it's not the sort of thing I do. Should we support clinical trials by being? It's up to you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Is there any uh, burning desires? <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Dylan. My name is John Lundberg, and I work with a, a drug users group in Ireland, Ishka it's called. And we advocate for the rights of people who are using drugs and who unfortunately maybe end up addicted to drugs and have to suffer the consequences that come with that. So within that, and looking at treatment and <coughs> attempts to uh, engage in treatment uh, uh, programs which aren't that readily available and as I'm sure everybody here is aware it's quite difficult to get into treatment when one has made a decision to move in that direction. Um, there aren't enough, up to my mind, there aren't enough uh, choices out there. You're given, uh, in the Irish perspective, the uh, government gives us or allows us to to decide to go on a methadone program if and when uh, someone decides that they want to face or deal with the addiction. Um, we don't have any other choices. There's no all the other drugs that are spoken about. So what I'd be asking is, is like that, all treatment modalities would be considered. You know, now I understand this thing about trials and about like having the efficacy around whether the drug is useful or not, but from my perspective is drug users will use any drug if they hear about it, like you know, and when I hear these uh, comments about 30% increase or 300% increase over three or four years, I mean rumour will, will, will uh, nearly dictate uh, the, 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 uh, the amount of drugs used or the type of drug use or, you know, trends as they go, like you know. So I've heard about this other game like maybe 10, 15 years ago or something like that. Can you ask the question now? Yes. So we oh, got to all the speakers. Yeah. Oh, sorry, yeah. yeah. So I'd, still, I'd be still interested in it. I've never seen it, I've never uh, experienced it. But um, from what I heard about it, it's an interesting kind of drug. So I'm just saying about choice, it's around giving people the, uh, the uh, option to make choices. We're all grown, you know, we should be considered all kind of mature human beings, so hopefully, like, you know what I mean? So, just around that, around choice, thanks. Well, we agree on a lot. We agree, seems to me, you and me agree on the fact that this is a troubling condition for a lot of people, that uh, the treatment system leaves a lot to be desired, that, um, and this is, unfortunately, in almost every country in the world, people have difficulty getting into treatment and when they, as you quite rightly point out, when they get into treatment the options are very few. And I, I, I'm ashamed to say I agree with that as someone who provides treatment. I wish we could uh, provide better treatment and more options. Uh, we have to play the, the cards that, that we're dealt with. Um, uh, in terms of uh, recommending that uh, people should use a drug that of unknown effectiveness and unknown safety, uh, as a doctor, I don't advocate that. As an individual, I don't think it's a safe thing to do. I think that, I'm repeating myself, but I think we have so many instances, so many examples where uh, panaceas have been recommended, sold at high price, found to be worthless, and not only worthless, but also dangerous. And um, I don't think we know yet in 2008 that Ibogaine falls into that category, but it might fall into that category. And because of the thalidomide, disaster that befell us 40 years ago, uh, I, I won't recommend and I won't use and I won't prescribe a drug unless I know that it is effective and that it's safe.